Okay, well, welcome everyone to uh, the Biblical History Center's virtual lecture with our special guest, Dr. John Cook of LaGrange College. Um, he's going to be speaking about um, exposition and crucifixion in antiquity. We are so excited to have him with us as an expert in this field, uh, featured on television specials even um, about Roman crucifixion. Um, and uh, please, if you're interested in virtual lectures or other special events like this, please check out our Facebook page, um, Biblical History Center, or our website, biblicalhistorycenter.com. We've always got something new and exciting going on at the Biblical History Center. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Cook. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. I have worked on this material now, I guess going on almost 10 years. I didn't, I mean, I haven't, in, in fact, I just, uh, an article is just getting ready to come out. So I'm not quite sure how I got into this crucifixion business, but <laughs> uh, it was sort of a sideline from a book that I was working on uh, and on Roman attitudes towards the Christians and one of uh, from about in the first century. And in that book, I, I worked a lot on Nero's uh, persecution of the Christians and some of them he burned to death on crosses. So uh, I think that got me interested in sort of Roman punishments. And from there, a mentor asked, in Germany named Martin Hengel asked me to expand it into a book. So one thing led to another, and here I am. All right, Christy, if you go to the next slide. My computer's thinking about it real quick. There we go. <laughs> okay. All right, excellent. Um, a man came to the college who was getting ready to be president of a seminary, and he told us that this verse from Mark was a victory song. Um, when Jesus cries out, uh, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he told us that was a victory song. And, I, and a lot of the movers and shakers of the college were there. And, um, <laughs> but I told him that, that this is absolutely not a victory song. It's a sign, it's a, a sign of, of despair. I mean, the psalm has a good ending, and I'm sure Jesus ended, you know, not in despair. But the but the work that I've been doing helps me understand why a person, you know, would say something like this because crucifixion was absolutely brutal. Okay, Christy. Now, um, this is the oldest image that I have of something that is sort of tangentially related to crucifixion. It's a watercolor of a tomb um, that was found in Rome. And I'll, I'll, there's some sort of closer ups that I'll show you a little bit later, but it's a triumphal procession. And these four horses would have pulled a cart and then the the high Roman official, a praetor or a consul, would have had these six police officers called lictors. And another thing they did, Paul mentions triumphal possession in, in 1 Corinthians, but another thing they did in these processions would put captives to death. And this, and okay, if you click that, Christy, let's, this is a man who's being tortured to death by exposure. In other words, they're not beating him to death. They just attached to him to what it, what I call the patibulum here, the cross piece, horizontal piece of a cross. And he just, in other, in other words, they, this, this punishment called exposition was just as brutal, um, although I think he's standing on the ground. Okay. And these are the warriors. They would have some warriors to uh, to dance, um, or I shouldn't say dance, carry out battle games um, during these uh, processions. So one more, Christy. 
All right, and this is what's left now. Um, as you can see, the, the painting, the watercolor from the 19th century shows everything, but the, the images now that are left are in a very interesting museum, sort of on the south side of Rome. Um, but there you can see the, what's called the fasces, um, the reeds and the ax. And that was the sign of authority of a police officer, of a lictor. And it's where uh, the Italians took their word fascism from uh, World War II, I guess. Okay. And this is what's left now of the tortured man. And as you can see, I'll show you on the next slide when I finish this, but as you can see, there is something holding his wrist to the crossbar. Now, it used to be, at, from the watercolor, it's clear that the crossbar went all the way across. Um, but this is a, this is a, a sign of the torture uh, that you can't move, you can't, they don't give you anything to drink, you don't eat, you just gradually die of exposure. Uh, just, it's utterly brutal. Okay, Christy, let's go. And here is a close up of the wrist. And I think you can see the fetter um, that helps attach him to the cross piece. And I've thought a lot about um, the crucifixion of Jesus where um, in the gospel of John, he shows them the marks of the nails in his palms. And I have heard people say, well, that wouldn't hold a person up. But if that's true, and I don't know that that's true, actually, I haven't checked it out with a biologist and physicist, but a doctor told me he thinks it would hold. But if it's true that the palm wouldn't hold on the cross piece, then they could easily use some kind of fetter like this or a rope to also support the arm. Um, but I just find this, this tomb fascinating. It's, it's not a crucifixion scene, but it's an early analogy. Um, the Romans are the ones who, I, I believe, first adopted crucifixion as a punishment. Okay. Go on to the next slide. Let's move on, Christy. All right. Now, this is, the Romans may have taken the exposure from the Greeks. I don't know. But a kista is a bronze box, and this is simply a drawing of an image on the bronze box. But as you can see, you know, this is in the Greek mythology of Andromeda. She was exposed here, and here's fetters around her wrists. Uh, she was exposed for, you know, the monster to come and kill her, but she was saved by the hero. Okay. Now, um, this is the most ancient image of crucifixion that we know of. And um, one of the things that kind of got me into this research was I just accidentally came across uh, a reference to this in a book. And, and, I, and I wrote some articles about it for a New Testament journal. So it, nope, since, it was, it was buried so deep in the classical literature, so to speak, that, uh, that I think I was one of the first, maybe not the first, but one of the first to bring this up in a New Testament journal. So I think that's kind of how people started associating me with this theme. And I've done more work on it than I ever wanted to. But in this image, you can see it's a, a T shape. Um, in other words, a capital T in the cross. And it is not, um, it's not the, the Latin cross that you normally see where the part goes up high here, like a small T. But, and there's an inscription that I'll show you in the next slide that says Alcamilla, which is a woman's name. And I don't know that these marks here are the sign of flagellation of beating, but it's possible. And it is also possible 
that she is sitting on a little sort of seat here, what the Latin, the Latin term is sedile, a little seat. Um, but I've got a friend in art history, an Australian friend who works on crucifixion too, and she does not, um, she's at Yale right now, but she does not think that's necessarily uh, a seat, but it's possible. Um, well, let's go on to the next slide. This is a drawing um, that an Italian did of the entire thing, and he thinks the seat is clear. And if that's true, it's, he makes it a little clearer than <laughs> the image does. But you can also see that her wrists are attached um, to each end of, the, of what I call the patibulum, all right? This is what a person carried through the streets, not the entire cross, it'd just be too heavy. Um, and the Latin authors, the reason I say that is that's what the Latin authors who refer to this um, describe it. Uh, uh, the criminal or whatever carries the this piece and then this is there already set either in the ground or lying on the ground when they get to the place there for the crucifixion. All right, let's go one more. Now, um, I'm sure it's been a while uh, since you did your Greek letters, Christy, but you might be able to see that's an alpha, that's a kappa, kappa, yoda, and that's the M. So A L K I M. I L A, Alcamilla. I don't know that the same person that did the graffito of the crucified individual did this um, name up here. Um, it does look a little bit different, but in any case, the person who wrote Alcamilla here meant to depict a crucified woman. And the Romans would crucify women, uh, slaves especially, and possibly. Um, lower class people, foreigners. Um, I don't think they crucified citizens very much. But the man that gave me these photographs, Giuseppe Camadeca, he is, he works, he's a professor that works over there. And he is supposed to come out with the final archaeological report on this little taberna. And I'll show you what that is in just a second. Go ahead and click it, Christy. All right, this is a photograph I made. And some I think you can see the letters a little bit better, but I could not control the sunlight. I didn't bring a big sheet. Uh, as you can see, plenty of other people have left graffiti in this little, it's called a taberna. Um, and the date is probably from the time of Trajan or Hadrian, according to Professor Kamadeka. In other words, it's after the fall of uh, um, after the eruption of Vesuvius. All right, let's go one more. And this just gives you an idea of how small the graffito is. But here's the door of the taberna. Now, a taberna would be a place sort of like an inn, maybe a little restaurant. And um, uh, we had a trip to Rome. I did it with the college, and uh, I got to. Um, got to see the Taberna the first time. And uh, I've been there since, four years later. But the thing is, it's very interesting. It's owned in by private individual. And he uh, he ran a restaurant nearby. Um, and, and fortunately for me, I have some contacts. This is the town of Putioli, which is now called Pazzuoli. And keep in mind that this is also the same town where they found the inscription about crucifixion that I'm going to show in a minute. Um, but I just find this very uh, sort of moving scene because, you know, the, the brutality of this Roman punishment becomes sort of real when you look at how the ancients depicted it. And I have a book on Roman graffiti. And frankly, the things that they tended to, to draw on the walls were not crucifixions, at least not that we found. They loved to draw gladiators 
and um and and they love to draw ships and all sorts of things or inscribe them um and imagery from you know sexual things and the romans were pretty crude about that and or some of the romans but not crucifixion this is one of two graffiti that have been found um so let's click it and move on and this is me coming out of the Traperna. This I think they found five or maybe seven. I've kind of forgotten. But as I said before, this is on private ground and it's normally, it's just covered up by a um, iron door. And I think at some point, the Italians will take these images off the wall and move them. <laughs> okay, let's move. Let's to the next slide. All right. Um, when Nero persecuted the Christians, one of the things he did in, in the after the fire of Rome that lasted nine days in 64 AD, one of the things he did was to tie them up, put animal skins all around them so that wild dogs would kill the Christians. He also crucified some and some he burned. But this one um, I put in here because it's in an article on crux, which means the vertical piece. And it helps show you that you did not always have to have the horizontal. But this is actually, if you can see the little hole there, this is from a lamp. It's a, a clay lamp. Um, and the olive oil would have been in here and the wick would have come through here. And it's uh, and it goes to show you how easily it was for the Romans to set somebody up to be executed by wild animals, in this case, a lion. Okay. All right, now here's another one. Um, and in this case, the man is actually suspended on, now I don't think they would call this a crux because that's used solely for crucifixion, C-R-U-X. But here you have the handler. Um, he's got a sword in one hand and a whip in the other, and the bear is killing the victim. Um, and this is on something called red slipware, which was a very fancy form of, uh, of pottery. Now, um, the person who made this photograph told me that it's been, it was found in a funerary context, in other words, in a grave. But I asked her if they also used it in their for their meals, and she said yes. So in other words, this it, it would be sort of like us having fine china with a cap with a scene of capital punishment on it, you know, somebody being hung or something. Um, so that's maybe a sign. And this would have happened in an arena, by the way, like a coliseum. All right. Let's go on. All right, this is the other um, image of crucifixion that has survived antiquity. This was found in the 19th century, and it is in a, a small museum on the Palatine Hill, which is, if you ever have a chance to go to the Roman Forum, um, you, you can miss this because you have to walk up the hill to find it, and it's, the hill is big. But I've got a, a slide following that's a drawing of this. But in Greek, it says, Alexamenos, in very bad Greek, worships his God. All right. And, and, and if you notice, this is a T shape again. You have the patibulum here and the crux here. Now, this was probably a scene of a, um, some kind of like a play. Um, the Romans have a word for it. It's not coming to me at, at the moment. But anyway, Al Camilla was depicted um, without clothing, but this person has a tunic on it. And it is a blasphemous depiction of the crucifixion of Christ because they give the individual a donkey's head. And you'll see that um, in the next slide a little easier. But here's um, Alexamenos. Now, um, people think that it may have come out of a school for slaves, for imperial slaves, called a pedagogium. I'm not so sure about that. But in any case, 
um, they moved it to a museum where it's kept carefully. Um, let's go to the next slide. It's be a little easier to see. All right. So here you can see the man that's worshiping the donkey head figure and God, uh, in other words, is um, he's he's creating a blasphemy of Christ, in other words, as if he had a donkey head. Um, and the person's handwriting is not very good either. And his grammar is not very good. But in any case, it's a very famous image and it's been known for well over 120 years. All right, let's move on. Now, if there's any one thing in this presentation that shows the brutality of Roman crucifixion, it's this. This was found in the 60s in a graveyard in Jerusalem. Um, Johanan ben Hagkol, and it's, it is on his sarcophagus box. So this man was from a prominent family because he was buried in a tomb with other family members and they actually put his name on his box but it is a this calcanium i think it had to be glued back together but there's some olive wood here and it goes to show you that they just like alcamilla um, the legs would be put on either side of the vertical the heels um, that's a little centimeter stick there i think it's 11 and a half centimeters long, this nail. All right, let's move one on. All right, and this is, uh, now the, obviously the nail is not this long, but it's just there for an image. Um, but this is how they would have nailed this person to the cross, right through the heel bone. And I talked to Dr. Guy in LaGrange about this, and he told me that, um, you could get a nail through heel bone without shattering it. In this case, it shattered the man's heel bone and had to be glued back together. But he said that Dr. Guy uh, told me that you can put all sorts of pins and heel bones nowadays without them shattering. Um, all right, let's go one more. Now, uh, Josias had given me these other photos, and this was his son. Um, I don't much like this part of the picture here. I think probably you'd go with Al Camilla where the hands or, or, or wrists are attached to either end here. Um, but this is a good depiction of the heel bones being um, attached to either side of the vertical. Um, but, it's brutal. Uh, let's go on. Now, um, for one reason or another, um, this is only the second find of a calcaneum, that is a heel bone and nail. And it was just found about a year ago in Cambridgeshire, <clears throat> which is outside of Cambridge, a little town called Fenstonton. They found the whole skeleton. And interestingly enough, only one of the heel bones was um, penetrated by a nail, but they did find a nail. The thing about crucifixion nails is that they were used in magic. And the Jewish texts, the rabbinical texts talk about that, and the pagan texts talk about that. And unfortunately, probably some of the Christians that <laughs> weren't weren't quite converted enough or sanctified enough, they used amulets too. Um, some of the church fathers uh, criticized that pretty severely. But um, this is it's an absolutely fascinating find because it's from around the, the year 300. And um, Dr. Duhigg um, is an osteo, archaeo, archaeo osteologist. She deals with old bones and um, she's the one that, that Sent, gave me this photograph, uh, but but she is writing up the final sort of scientific article on it, or the initial scientific article, but an informal one has already appeared in Biblically Archaeology, so if you 
if you Google Finstanton crucifixion and you can find it, it's British archaeology, excuse me, not Brit biblical archaeology. Uh, but I, but the, this did, the heel bone was not shattered. And so it goes to show you that the nail could be, uh, go through without destroying it. Again, uh, I think it shows the utter pain um, associated with this punishment and the fact that these nails were valuable for magic is just the, one of the strangest things to me. But, but the authors, the ancient authors do talk about it. And so it's possible that people removed the nails from crucified individuals for such purposes. And I also think it could be just reused because um, nails weren't super cheap then. All right, let's go on. Now I have um, an image in color of this, but I think the black and white maybe works better. This is from around the early part of the third century, maybe the late second. It is the um, Felicity Harley McGowan, this art history professor I, I mentioned earlier. She told me this is the first time, well, that Jesus is depicted nude on a cross for, and, not, and he's not depicted that way for a thousand years. I think sometimes they use loincloths or a little shirt, like in the case of the Palatine Graffito. Um, but this is called the Pereir Gem, and it has um, some Christian words on it, but it also has some magic words on it. So it, it is something like an amulet, but it's a very beautiful um, jasper, and it's very tiny. Um, it's only about that big, if you can see. Um, it, and it's... As you can see also, the legs are on either side of the upright. Now the person didn't bother to attach them, but there are, the wrists are attached with fetters, as with the man in the, the tomb that I showed right at the beginning. And again, it's a T-shaped cross. So it is not, um, it's not the Latin cross that we see in churches. All right. Let's go on. Now, this is something that I don't have an image, a stone image of this um, inscription, but it's this is bad Latin again, in cruce figaris, which means get crucified. It was found in the Stabian Baths of Pompeii. Um, I don't, I doubt very seriously that it's still there, still visible, because a lot of these things do. Uh, do decay. But this I got out of a book um, of these inscriptions from Pompeii. And this is the kind of sort of joke that the slaves would tell each other. Um, they, because crucifixion was such a, a reality in their lives that they had gallows humor about it. So this is what we call gallows humor. Okay. Let's move. All right. This is an inscription that is still there, although it's not nearly as legible now. Um, but it's on some tombs in Pompeii. And it's an advertisement for gladiatorial games and for a crucifixion. Um, so his tombs would have been here. And outside is this advertisement for these games at the local town nearby of Kumai. So let's click one more. All right, this is the Latin of it. This, and just think about this word, cruci arii, means people to be crucified. And it gives you the date. Let's, one more, let's go one more. So um, it's, I don't know what year it's referred to, but it definitely is before the eruption of Vesuvius. But it gives you the dates of whatever year they were in. Uh, 1st, 5th, and 7th of October, and there are going to be 20 gladiatorial pairs who fight, and then there will be a fight with wild beasts, and they're going to have a, an awning, so I guess that will help knock off, cover the rain, um, and then he says, the, in tiny little letters, Cuniculus, who's the one that put up the, the who drew the, the painting, uh, he hails Lucaeus, that is his friend. 
Um, so it's just, it's just sort of a crazy thing, but the people who want to go to this gladiatorial games in the, the amphitheater in Kumai, um, they get to watch people crucified too. So it's like added entertainment for these Romans. And, and you, as you can understand, for, for at least for me, this is sort of the underbelly, the dark side of the empire. All right, let's move one more. You can find, by the way, you can find pictures of that amphitheater at Kumai online. This is in the same town where the um, Alcamilla Graffito was found in Pudioli in the late 50s, they found a stone. It's actually, um, I think it's, well, I don't know if it's two pieces or three, but in any case, um, let's go one more. Uh, this is the reconstruction of the title in one book. I'm not sure it's cor correct, but Libitina was the goddess of funerals. And, and let's go one more. A person, um, I've got a translation just in a minute, but I'm going to hold on here. A person um, would franchise out the right to bury people and would franchise out the buy, rent the franchise to. Uh, to crucify people. So here you've got this word patibulum or patibulatum, which means wearing the patibulum. And uh, this is for slaves. Let's go one more. Um, obviously, I'm not going to read this whole thing out, but the cross, the crux, was the vertical beam, and they brought the patibulated person, the person carrying the patibulum, to the cross. And the contractor will have to supply floggers and chains and cords, and each of them gets paid four sesterces, which is about the equivalent of a denarius, a day's wage. And everybody gets paid the same, it looks like. So now that's for slaves. If you want to crucify your female slaves or your male slaves. Now, when they have a public crucifixion, this is what the contractor has to do. And it mentions nails, pitch, wax, and candles. Wax, pitch, wax, and candles would have been for torture. And then they drag the cadaver out with a hook to the place where the burial is. All right, let's move forward. Let's see if you can play that video, Christy. Does it have any sound? It was not letting the sound through because I was muted. So let me fix that. Sorry. All right. Go ahead and click on Christy. All right. Constantine, the first Christian emperor, replaced crucifixion with a much quicker death. Now, this is an image from a Greek copy of Genesis, which was originally written in Hebrew, of course, but the Jews needed it translated. And so it's an illuminated hand, handmade manuscript. I think it's about sixth century. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. But you can see the man up here. Um, that was put to death according to Joseph's dream. Um, boy, I'm embarrassed. Is it the baker? I think so. <laughs> the baker, yeah. And they put him up on this thing called a forca, a fork, and, and just left him there by the neck. And I think it broke the neck very quickly. But it's a, uh, it's a manuscript of Genesis, and it's uh, portraying the story of the, you know, where Joseph interpreted the dreams and Pharaoh had a, uh, a great banquet, and the cupbearer tells Pharaoh about Joseph being able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. And any, but okay. And, and so they put this um, person to death using 
the form of, of capital punishment that Constantine replaced crucifixion with. And you'll see that a little easier in the next slide. This is called a furca, and they would just put the person's neck here. And I, and I, and I think just probably pull the ladder out or whatever quickly. And I, I think the person died very fast, as in a hanging. I think it broke your neck. Um, and this little piece was to hold you still. Okay. Now, the person whose research I looked at for this, this is Japanese, um, a punishment called Haritsuke, told me that they were doing this before the Jesuits came to Japan. Well, what happens here is they, they, and it's almost like crucifixion, they expose the person on the cross, and then they, they penetrate the lung cavity, the pleural cavity with these spears. And so I guess that, you know, eventually they, that would kill you, um, I assume pretty fast. But this, these are lower class people in Japan, and you'll see that in just a second. But this was a, just a brutal punishment. And uh, boy, trying to find this image was no fun. Um, all right, one, let's go to the next one. I better warn you, the next one is real. This was probably the end of the last shogunate in Japan. And apparently this man had robbed his masters. And in, during the robbery, the master's son had been killed. Um, and so uh, there's a real crucifixion there. His name is Sokichi. And uh, the person that did the photograph in the 19th century um, colorized a little bit. Let's go on to the next one. So here you see Sokichi. And here are these lower class Japanese men that carried out the executions and also beheadings. There's, what is it, six, six or five human heads on this that are exposed here. So, you know, the Japanese could be pretty brutal with their punishments too. Felice Beato, he's the one that did these photos. And here you can see in the background, Sokichi and, um, you know, his side is just all bloody. Um, that's enough of that. Let's move on. All right, not to, um, to have sort of the more positive side here. The British sent a, a Polish prisoner, um, well, a, a man named, for the Polish free forces. The British sent this Stefan Jasinski to try and create an uprising at Auschwitz, but he was caught. And on the wall, he carved, and I know, I'm sorry, the photograph is not very good. He carved in concrete an image of Christ's, uh, a crucifix sort of, but um, it's part of the, of a, a form of devotion called the Sacred Heart. Um, let's go one more. And here you have this image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Polish prisoner is sort of holding on to him, but it is part of the sign that Christ's uh, suffering is redemptive and, and this man being in the very worst place you can imagine, felt it. All right, let's go one more. This is my friend, um, I met him when I was a pastor in Asheville area, I met him at the University of a at Asheville actually. Um, and <laughs> He used to teach me rabbinics, uh, the Jewish stuff, um, rab rabbinic literature sometimes, and we hung out a lot. And I later visited him in, in Hungary, but he survived Auschwitz for a year and then later Dachau. But he's one of the people to whom I dedicated my book on crucifixion. And that is the end. So you can um, stop the slideshow, Christy. Yeah, let me get the, 
I've got, I keep looking back and forth like this. I'm not, not looking at you guys. I've got two screens. Set up. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, wow. Thank you so much, uh, for that. Um, and that was a, a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I had heard of the Puteoli inscription and the Alexa Minos inscription, but the advertisements that was all new to me. So, um, that was, um, fascinating, morbid, but fascinating. Um, so yeah. thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Cook? Um, I have one. Well, I might have two, but I'll just go with one for now. Um, so you said the Romans definitely invented crucifixion. Yes. I think they did. I think, you know, they may have gotten something from the Carthaginians, but I think that they're now in Assyria, they would ram people down on sharpened stakes, you know, like through your chest mm -hmm. or something. But I think the Romans developed crucifixion. Okay, because there was, um, I think there's a theory that the Persians originally invented crucifixion, but then the Romans kind of improved it, quote unquote. Yeah, I I think the Persians did this thing called impalement. Okay. Um, but the thing is, the Romans did that some impaled people, um, but the the evidence that we have is not very, it's not much. Um, I think they preferred to do it this way, um, but the Romans could impale people. But yes, it's definitely true that in the Near East, they did impale people from the Assyrians and the Persians. And, and I think it's also possible that they that the Greeks practiced a form of, of it's not exactly impalement, but they would um, put a person up against a board and just attach it, attach them to it with metal fetters. So, you know, it's it I guess what you said is actually a, a great. Uh, a great answer that the Romans perfected it. So, I mean, I think it was, you know, there's various forms that are similar before the Romans, but uh, I believe that during this, uh, this war with Carthage is, is where the reports of crucifixion first start coming up and the so-called second Punic war. And, and that was a Roman thing. But yeah, um, there's a, a, a person um, named David Chapman who's written a lot about this uh, Near Eastern business. And there are some bronze doors in the British Museum that show the Assyrians impaling people mm -hmm. on these stakes, but they went right through the chest here. Pretty horrible. I just know that the Romans like to take things from other cultures and mm -hmm claim that they did it first and so yeah. that's what I was really plagiarized if you yeah will. that's a it's you know it's possible the Carthaginians did it some um and you know it had survived I mean it, it it's still being carried out here and there in the world so uh, it, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that the Persians did did it I think Thank you. Sure. Dr. Cook, I have a question for you. Hi. Um, okay. Just Hi. Up. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you had mentioned that on the, I guess, not graffiti, I, um, the correct word is escaping me, but on the, the, the drawings and the sketches on the wall, there weren't many found of the crucifixions and yet all the other things that they did, the ships, the, the warriors, the gladiators, what would you think, what would your guess be of why they almost downplayed the crucifixions if they actually took it to almost to a perfection level in their culture? Wouldn't they want to glorify that and draw that all over the place as well and just play it up and glorify it as well? You know, that's a great question. And I've been, I've been wondering about that for a lot of a long, a long time. I think for one, re one reason it was so horrible that they didn't, they didn't like to publicize it. But there's a passage in one of the Roman orators named Cicero that says that the word crucifixion shouldn't even be in the ears of a Roman. In other words, they, they tried to 
sort of sweep it under the rug as much as possible. It's um, on the other hand, they would crucify people at, at the big public places. So you have to wonder, you know, what is it? But but I've got a book back there in my library that um, has literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of graffiti, and only two of them are the crucifixion. So, wow. you know, I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. it's just a strange thing. But I I, I for one reason is probably too horrible. Another reason is that maybe it was so common they just didn't feel like it was necessary. Mm -hmm. But they they like depicting animals killing people, and like, as I said before, they put it on their fancy um, dinnerware. So yeah, you know, go figure. Yeah, I think too though the the rarity of it kind of gives it a little bit more shock and awe when you do see it. You know. Um, you know, maybe it's kind of like, um, you know, coarse language or something like that would be today. Mm -hmm. The the rarer that it is, the more shocking and actually like, you know, it, it stops you in your tracks and really makes you think that it is. And so maybe that's kind of what they're trying to do too. They're, they're trying to make a point, um, you know, this is what happens when you you cross us. And so by Cicero saying, you know, it shouldn't be in your mouth it it makes it a little bit more shocking when you do see it and when you do hear it like i heard i heard and it might be based off of that cicero quote that it's almost like a a cuss word to a a roman in high society to talk about crucifixion um but i again i'm not the, i'm not the expert those are great thoughts i don't think they like to talk about it the i mean i don't like to i don't like to talk about capital punishment <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> you know you know, and I, I mean, how many people in Georgia know where the, you know, the death penalty is carried out? You know, I mean, I, it's not something that really is on the front page of a paper. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I had a student at the college once, uh, a religion major who, her mother was the assistant warden of that prison and she couldn't become the warden because she couldn't pull the switch to execute the, you know, the, the men and, um, and I'd never even heard of this place before. So, you know, it, 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 but the thing is the, the Romans had a taste for blood. I mean, the gladiators and they, they fight with wild beasts, but in part, you know, for a person to die of crucifixion could take days sometimes. So, you know, maybe that's one reason too. Good question. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. Um, any anybody else have any questions for Dr. Cook? Which texts um, say that they crucified women? And um, because you mentioned that they crucified women, could it be women of any social class, or was it like specifically like uh, lower class women or prostitutes? Like, what are we talking about when we say that they crucified women? Well, that, that law of Puteoli, that law of Puteoli talks about crucifying slave women. Okay. Um, but I think sometimes with the lower class women, they could be crucified. Mm -hmm. And it's been a while since I've, I've worked through this, but um, there is, a, there is there, there's fictional literature where uh, they talk about crucifying a woman character. Um, and she's sort of a middle-class type figure, mm -hmm. but it's, so it's not, you know, it's not just limited to males. And mm -hmm. because, I mean, that inscription is so clear that, you know, the, the slave or the slave, you know, slave woman, male slave or female slave, uh, it, it includes both. And then Alcamilla, of course, is, mm -hmm. is a woman's name and and whoever put that inscription there meant for a person to understand it as a woman being crucified so um, you know that's another example that immediately springs to mind well um, i was i was reading in josephus the other day too and near the passage where it talks about um jesus is a description of a woman named ide 
who was involved in bringing down the character of a female aristocrat in Rome proper um, in the temple of Isis. And um, she was not, she was a free woman, but she was not a citizen. And she was actually a former slave. She had been freed um, and she was crucified for her crimes. Yeah, that's right. That's a good one. That's another one. Yeah, it's in my book, but I haven't looked at this book in a while. Yeah, but, so yeah, that's a um, famous story. We don't see as many women being crucified, but I personally just think that it's because they didn't have time <laughs> to, to to do as many crimes as men, just because they're the ones <laughs> responsible for a lot of the running of the household. So you have to have time to leave the house if you're going to do some of these things. Yeah. But that's just my opinion. I don't know if that's true or not. It just yeah, think they, um, another debate is how many people did they crucify and they really don't have much evidence for that i mean it's probably over a hundred thousand mm -hmm. but if you um one of the people who wrote the art an article on this one of the journalists about the fenstaton crucifixion he sort of cornered me and he said okay if we start at the year 200 and go to constantine stopping it around 300 that's 500 you know that's 500 years and 500 times what equals uh, 100,000. And I think he, what is it? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm embarrassed. Is it 200 or 2,000? My mental math is not great, <laughs> but it's still, that's still a lot of people. And we, we read accounts, two of them crucifying, you know, like 6,000 people in Galilee, a couple thousand people for outside of Rome mm -hmm. with the um, Spartacus rebellion. So they could be really efficient with it if they wanted to be. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't expect them to have a lot of remains left because most of the time these people aren't getting proper burials. They're left to the birds they're thrown in the dump they're you know so there's not you wouldn't expect to have a whole lot left after all that it is it is an interesting you know it's interesting that they tried to hide it sometimes mm -hmm. by not talking about it but that they also made it so public mm -hmm. it's just a paradox yeah, yeah. Um, it's like they knew it was bad yeah. Yes. Well, 200 is the answer. And so, you know, if, if that's right, then it's 200 a year. But I, I don't think it's right. I think it's probably more than that. Yeah. In any case, it's it's just that's an insoluble question. Yeah. Um, because the for one reason, when the authors talk about it, it's usually one line. And if you, you know, if you read in the Gospels, I mean, you think how much, and, and that's one of the, the biggest descriptions of a crucified person in the, in the Gospels. But think about how many details does it really tell? Very few. I mean, Jesus carried his cross, Simon Sarini helped him, um, the nails on his palms, and, and it's just, there's not much. Uh, Pilate had him flogged, and, and that goes often with crucifixion. And they did not put a spear in his side. So, I mean, you know, if you just sort of start gathering little details like that, um, it's not much. So even the gospel writers sort of assume that you know what crucifixion is. Um, and so they reveal a few details, but they don't tell much. Mm. Well, does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Cook? Just appreciation for sharing all this. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. Watching. I felt like I was at school. I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a thought though, from what your last comment was, um, given the wonderful presentation and just, it's not a quick execution, obviously. I guess that's why it was so astonishing that Jesus died so soon. Uh, he had such a quick death. It, they were not expecting that. It sounds like they were almost shocked that they didn't have to break his legs because he was already dead. I mean, that's that's yeah. 
commentary right there. That's amazing. I think the flogging could be so brutal that a person could almost die from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, people did die from flogging. So, you know, that yes. that may have been part of it, that, that they weakened him through that. Um, yeah. In, and in yeah, case, reading, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I was reading, I forget, I forget where. Um, so I can't cite my source, I'm sorry. <laughs> but oh. someone had like seen his friend before and after being flogged, and he was like, I could see my friend's organs through his back or something to the equivalent of that. I forget what the source was though. I need to look that back up. There is a story in Josephus where uh this Jewish sort of prophet is prophesying the fall of the temple just a few years before, and they flog him so brutally. Uh, they bring him before the, the governor there, uh, and they flog him so brutally that his bones show. Uh, that might be one thing. Yeah, that might have been it. But in any case. The cross beam, how much would that have weighed? Would that somewhere, weigh somewhere between like 90 and 110 pounds? You know, that's, more, more than that. That's a good question. I'm not really sure. Um, I mean... How much does a four by four weigh? You know, you, let's just think about it. A four by four. Depending on how length, the length of it too. Maybe 30, 30 to 50, 60 pounds. Uh, probably not a hundred. Sorry, my husband uh, overheard the question and he was trying to answer. <laughs> <laughs> you said it was the type, depends on the type of wood? Yep. Okay. Probably the size too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Cook, um, it seems like the Roman culture and civilization perfected this. After the fall of the Roman civilization, is it safe to assume this practice ceased or was it other, um, other ancient civilizations incorporated it that there's historical evidence for or, or it sounds like it's still in places today. You, you mentioned that it's still happening. Um, I think, I think after Constantine came to power, it probably ceased for the most part. I mean, it ha I think it happened, there's evidence that it happened once or twice after. He came to power in 312, but I, I'm no, absolutely no authority on this, but what I understand is that occasionally um, it's practice post-mortem that a person who has been executed nowadays is uh, exposed on some kind of cross. And that is something you'd have to look for. Um, there's an, a researcher named Sean Anthony, and he's an expert on Islam. And I think that is probably being practiced some places in the Muslim world. Yeah, when, again, when I'm not going, sure. <laughs> when ISIS was going through Syria, um, I saw some pictures of they were still crucifying people as they went through. I don't know if it was post-mortem or not, because all the pictures I saw, they were already deceased. But yeah. So wow. you don't know, but um, that is a, that's something that I really can't claim to be any kind of authority on. But I do know it's mentioned in the Quran, crucifixion, so... I think it tends to be post-mortem though. All right, well, Dr. Cook, thank you so much for speaking and giving us your evening. Um, if, uh, is there anything, I always like to ask our guest speakers, um, you know, is there any way that outside of this lecture we can support you? You know, how can we make you rich and famous, right? Do you have books that you've written that we can purchase? Um, and if so, where can we go about doing that? How can how can we support you or or learn more? You're asking me that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, I won't advertise the book, but it's it's available and and um, <laughs> I it, the thing is it's expensive and I I really. I don't think it would be enjoyable reading for the public. Let me put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but 
for somebody <laughs> wanting to text. build a library, but for somebody <laughs> wanting to build a good library of resources, that could be a. <laughs> it's called Crucifixion in the Mediterranean World, um, and it's published in Germany by Moore Seebeck. But okay. there was a paperback issued in 2019, and I think some of those are still available. But um, awesome. Well, congratulations on your, your publication as well, Lynn. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you um, for coming, guys. This uh, will be posted to YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, but the benefit that you guys get for registering is that you guys actually get to ask yes. uh, Dr. Cook questions. Dr. Cook, again, thank you so much for giving us your evening um, today. And um, I'll be, I'll, I'll send you a message tomorrow about um, some, we'll have some things for you. So okay. thank you guys so thank much. You. And we um, appreciate you all coming and please join us for the next one. Our next um, virtual lecture will be taking place in February. Um, and we are gonna have a professor from Lipscomb University talking about the archeology span of Easter. Nice. Um, and then we have another virtual lecture after that in um, April, near the end of April. The exact date has not been set yet. And this is one of our Roman soldier reenactors um, that comes for Roman Army Day. Um, and he is going to be sharing um, his Roman coin collection and just details about Roman coinage in general um, and his kind of area of expertise there. So make sure you join us for those. Um, and... Thank you guys for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.